Welcome to Current Affairs at Copenhagen Suborbitals. What's happening right now in the Amateur Rocket Project, with the goal of launching a human being into space and bringing him safely back to Earth? Hosted by Jakob Larsen. Hello everyone and uh, welp- welcome back to the uh, Copenhagen Suborbitals Rocket Shop. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Fleming Rasmussen uh, here today for you. So, uh, welcome Fleming. Thank you. You're also known as uh, Fleming Rip, but we'll take that uh, at a later point. First of all, Fleming, how long have you been along uh, here with uh, Copenhagen Suborbitals? I uh, entered uh, Copenhagen Suborbitals in uh, 2010, uh, only as a um, secondary figure uh, driving the inflatable uh, in connection with the, with the launch campaign in mm-hmm. 2010 and about one year later I also went into production and development. Mm. And this is where you have some, some pretty special talents here and I think we just might jump straight to it. Uh, today's uh, topic here is jet veins and uh, the guidance and, and uh, correctional control we can have from the jet veins. So let's get right to it. I want to introduce first of all the jet vein assembly for the Nexu 2. This is uh, one of the things that we're a little bit proud of here. It's one of our pieces of art. It only has three out of four uh, graphite jet veins in place right now, but um, you can basically see the, uh, the concept here. It's a completely modular unit, so all we need to do is to bolt it on and connect some wires and uh, hook it up to the control system, and then we're ready to fly. So. What does this thing do, Fleming? It uh, it consists of uh, of four wings, where where you can see three of them here, and they uh, they are all able to move. And uh, as the jet passes these uh, almost plain surfaces, that uh, the wings will deflect the jet coming out of the engine, thus providing a steering force, uh, which you by controlling all four wings can can steer all three axes. That's probably probably quite important just to mention. This is right here where the business end of the engine is. So these are situated right at the jet exhaust. Exactly. The, 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 the very nozzle of the jet engine will be around this plane here. So they will take some heat. Mm. Okay. So just to take the function of it, if we want to, let's say, turn the rocket to one side, if you take one of them, yeah, we, like this, and we would basically be going this way. Yeah. Okay. Oops. No, I'm kidding. Okay, it's all in place. So we we do also uh, have the option to control to a certain degree the roll angle of the rocket by if, uh-huh. if you're taking two uh, opposite vanes and uh, turning them in opposite direction, it gives a slight uh, slight rolling moment. This is uh, this is a minor function as the uh, the rocket has uh, has also fins, so it, it's. Uh, it's a primary, a secondary function of the of the system, and the main focus is based on uh, pitch and yaw. Mm. But the roll control makes pictures look really good. Yes. All right. Now we've seen the jet vane assembly itself. So let's get back to the discussion of the jet vane itself because it is actually a quite good topic. So jet vanes are simply fins right in the exhaust. I mean, where does yes. that idea come from? Uh, yeah, it origins uh, the, the first rocket you saw with uh, with vanes for um, for steering. It was actually the A4 rocket from Second World War, also known as the V2, from uh, from the Germans, good old von Braun. Mm-hmm. And uh, the first um, the first venture into jet vanes in suborbitals was the previous rocket Sapphire. Uh, which was a hybrid rocket, uh, poor and uh, nitrous oxide. So we took a, we took a what is now 80 year old technology, and then we uh, we integrated it with with the hybrid rockets. Exactly. So what was it that Sapphire did? Sapphire was, uh, as far as I know, the first fully guided amateur rocket uh, in the world. Uh, it flew almost perfect. Uh, when it reached its apogee, it was uh, less than 100 meters uh, distance from its uh, launch position. So, so uh, it was uh, it was very very promising, and we were very very happy about it. 
Uh, it's a great venture in the art of flying straight because that's really hard with rockets, that's for sure. Yeah, th that was actually also the first rocket in Copenhagen suborbitals that, that actually flew straight to a satisfactory degree. Mm. Um, w when we did that design, which is quite different from what we're doing today with the next, we, we had some some other challenges to look at than we have today because when you're looking at the exhaust from a uh, hybrid rocket you see a lot of um, stuff, solids coming out of the nozzle which um, rules out the use of uh, graphite mains. Mm, why is that? What does the, this fuel grain do to the graphite veins? Uh, graphite veins, if we look here we have, we have basically two types of veins standing here on the table. We have a graphite vein and we have a copper vein. The graphite vein is, is extremely good to resist um, heat, as mm -hmm. it, w what actually happens to it, it slowly burns away in the heat, while uh, if you're looking at a copper vein, it would uh, eventually melt very fast away. But the copper vein is extremely solid, it can take a beating, so if stuff is coming out of the, of the engine, like small fragments of the, uh, of the fuel coming loose and exiting the nozzle, and hitting the wanes, they will withstand it without any problems. This wane has actually uh, lived a full burn in a uh, static test mm -hmm. in a sapphire, and you can hardly see any any issues on it at all. Uh, well, it's, it's quite beefy. I mean, uh, yeah. The, the thing is, since um, since it doesn't uh, burn away like the graphite, all the energy goes into it and must be absorbed. So uh, the reason it's so beefy is it's actually one big thermal reservoir. Mm. So it has, a, um, it has a limited lifetime. During the whole burn, this chunk of copper gets warmer and warmer. And at some point, the whole block will reach its melting point and just fluff away. And that's why copper is used. It has this heat conductivity that can distribute the heat into the reservoir before it gets local overheating. It, it, uh, it has as well a good uh, heat conductivity, but also a good uh, heat uh, capacity. Mm. So you can, you can store some energy in this one before it, it dies. The, the downside if, is, of course, it's very, very heavy. And mm. heavy is not something you like in rockets. Okay, so that one, the, copper, uh, the beefy copper uh, reservoir vein flew very well with sapphire. That yeah. was a hybrid engine. Yes. So we, I, I, I'll have to, to, to uh, put in that we also did tests with, uh, with graphite mm -hmm. veins on, uh, on sapphire, and they, uh, they eroded away in seconds. It got blasted away by pebbles, and then it was it, all it, over. Exactly. They were just sanded off. Mm. So, so that was out of the question. So we had to, to fly these, uh, these heavy stuff. So, if we just take a little quick step forward here, then we came to the Dexter class rockets. Something similar was tried again. I mean, we had success once before. Yeah, um, we had success with copper, we had failure with uh, graphite. Uh, okay, we were moving to a different uh, fuel technology, which was not nearly as aggressive, and on the other, sand, uh, on the other hand, also a lot warmer. So, um, we still wanted to go into graphite, but still we had a proven technology that we wanted to, to try. So we did um, two identical veins, one in copper and one in, uh, in graphite. And uh, we have to take a look at these two then. And uh, Well, let's, let's start with the copper one. The proven technology seemed to... Yeah, um, actually we have, we have a very, very good physicist in the in Copenhagen suborbitals, who made a statement that you can't have local temperatures in copper because of the very good heat conductivity. So his, um, his point was that if, if it started melting, it would melt all over at one, uh, at one time. But you can see on this one clearly that that didn't happen. So, um, well, I guess it proves uh, once again that rockets are, uh, are sort of a league of its own. It's, in fact, rocket science. <laughs> all right, so copper didn't work. Copper didn't work. Actually, the, these two uh, veins were, uh, were run um, in the same test, and uh, the, the copper one failed. Uh, there are some very, very nice pictures of that. It, it made a very, very nice green firework flame when the copper mm -hmm. evaporated. Uh, if you look at this one, you can see it all, it's, also, uh, it's also somehow worn a lot, but in a more controlled way, it still has um, almost... Uh, kept its complete steering forces 
because it's only a, a very small bit of the, the leading edge that has gone. So it, uh, the steering forces of this one is still okay, while on this one they are almost gone. So sort of the technology switched places, really. I mean, copper worked for the uh, for the hybrids. Uh, so graphite didn't, and suddenly copper doesn't work for biliquids, but graphite does. Uh, yeah. Uh, Probably someone uh, w will try to correct me on this because I'm sure it could be done with graphite on a hybrid, uh, and I'm sure it has been done. Mm. Um, the thing is, coming up with a graphite of good enough quality is rather hard and very expensive, and it's also a thing within Copenhagen Suborbitals. We have we have a budget we need to stick to. Mm. Uh, if money wasn't an issue, we could go into very expensive ceramic solutions and so on and save weight and pay maybe a thousand times the price we do for these. So, so we, we need to stick with, uh, with old-fashioned technology and with what we can get our hands on when we can afford. And that proved to be, uh, to be graphite for the, wow. the bioliquids. I mean, the Nixie One launch uh, speaks for itself. It went straight up once more. So. Yeah, it, uh, it definitely works. Even though it was com very much challenged due to the, the fuel issue we mm. had on it, or the oxidizer issue. All right, there's just one thing I wanted to point out about this one. Uh, these two are, or were, actually the yeah. same geometry when we started. Yeah, this is a, 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 an unused vein, and a vein that has uh, done a approximately 25-second burn. Uh, and as you can see, there's, uh, there's a lot of it missing. As I described earlier, it actually, uh, the vein itself burns away. And you will also, if you see videos of the static test, you will see them uh, white glowing. Hmm. Uh, but, but they can do that, and they don't disintegrate. They just slowly erode on the surface, and they keep almost all their, their steering force throughout a burn. But they see quite some substantial uh, force effects I mean, when you deflect them, they need to take up enough force in this little tiny structure to pitch around a rocket. Yeah, but, uh, but actually, um, those are the minor challenges for those. It's, it's the, the heat and the environment that are changed. The steering forces are not, that, are not that violent. But they have one additional drawback, which is drag. Yeah, of course, and uh, that, that's also the reason we uh, we moved from this very uh, bulky one to uh, to these more uh, streamlined types. They they do uh, offer less drag. Um, of course, they will they will generate drag, and I, I don't have the exact figures, but I think it's about ten percent of uh, of our um, trust we lose due to to these. But uh, that that's the way we currently can do it. Uh, yeah, okay, well, it, them. there are different ways of, of actually pitching around these rockets, and uh, of course someone's going to wonder, why choose the jet vanes and not just uh, aerodynamic uh, surfaces, control surfaces and stuff like this? So why did we settle with the jet vanes? The, the, the thing with, uh, with aerodynamic foils is they need air to work in, and our rockets hopefully will fly where there's no air. So, uh, so that's the reason we, we need to... The only way you can steer a rocket if you want to go outside the atmosphere is by uh, moving the, the thrust, thrust vector control. And that can be done either by jet vanes or by gimbling uh, one or more rockets. And since our rockets are all uh, single engine ones, uh, you, you have limited possibilities for mm. control. You, you, for example, you can't do roll control with a single engine. Yeah, that you, would pose a problem. Yeah, you can do pitch and yaw, but... Uh, but not road. Yeah, I just want to add that, that we actually stick with single engine rockets, basically just out of uh, reliability. I mean, the more engines, the higher the, uh, f yes. the possibility yeah. of an error. So we just stick to simple and trustworthy. Yeah. Just a single engine. If we should talk a little bit about uh, manufacturing of these, uh, these veins, they are, of course, all um, CNC milled. Uh, which is also a bit challenging with these materials. People who uh, went to the into the trade know that a material like copper is really shitty to work in in, in mechanical machines because the, it's it's a very uh, oh what's the English word? It's, it's a very elastic material. 
Yeah, and it so doesn't. The, 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 bit, it doesn't the bits come off. They, they, it don't go into small bits. It just. It's long threaded uh, yeah, uh, chips. It, so some some dough coming off. Yeah. Actually, uh, on the other hand, the graphite is is very very easy to uh, to work in. You can almost uh, cut it with a nail. But the dust coming off it when you are when you're working on automated machines with it is. It's micro particles, really. Yeah, and it, it's it's horrible. Um, you can either choose to vacuum while you're doing it, or you can choose to use uh, some cooling agent, like uh, cutting oil. And if you're doing the first, you don't catch everything. If you're doing the last, you uh, you ruin your cutting oil because it gets into graphite dough. Mm. But aren't, isn't this a graphite material uh, brittle? I mean, doesn't it break if for no apparent reason? I mean, it sticks in the rocket in then that's for sure, yeah, but during machining it should be... Yeah, no, you, 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 of course you need to know what you're doing, so you need to, to move a bit careful, um, very high RPMs on the tools and, and very low uh, very low movement, mm. so... So a lot of patience yeah. and then... You yeah, can still and, and you can actually, if you see this one, you can see it has got a, it's got a dent here because uh, it has been it's just by fitting it inside the holder. It's completely unimportant for the functionality of it, but uh, but you need to treat them very carefully. Mm. We also have a very nice foam box we store them in when they're not on display or in use. Yeah, they're quite precious to us, these little things. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I think we're, we're going to stop here for now. So this is, was a very, very good uh, look and insight into the whole jet vane discussion. I mean, I think we've been all through it now from the jet vane assembly itself all the way back from when the technology emerged, what we've done in Copenhagen suborbitals and what we're doing right now again here uh, this summer with the Nexi 2 rocket. So thank you very much for the insight, Fleming. You're welcome. For further information about Copenhagen Suborbitals and our mission, please go to our YouTube channel as well as our homepage www.corpsart.com. As we're funded entirely by sponsors and donors, we need the support of our many fans to reach our goal of manned amateur spaceflight. You can support us by contributing through the support page. <laughs>